Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I am your host, Ren, and today we continue with the House of Bloodstein, Mentralysis, Part 3, Chapter 7, Queen Gum, and we get to the lady at last. No, I wasn't teasing, which I, I do sometimes in other books about this. Sometimes I, I tease a, a big nasty villain, and then they never show up. In this case, the villain shows up. So far, this part of the book has been focused on Philip, Thomasina, King, and Clara on their quest for the Chadburn last chapter. They found where the Chadburn goes, they put it in, uh, all kinds of gases vented, and then the, the bower chest seemed to shut down. So now we're going to switch gears and we're going to find out what happened to Kay. Some people think I forgot about Kay in Leica. And as I've said before, I forget nothing. It's just got to bide my time for the proper moment to strike. And it is now. Also, as a added bonus, I, I really wanted a different voice to do Queen Gome other than my own. You know, I wanted something different and so I was able to talk my cover artist Carol Phillips who is a burgeoning singer on YouTube by the way you should check her out lots of fun very nice renditions of various songs that she likes is agreed to voice Queen Gome and I think you'll enjoy that so this is a long chapter it's 23 pages Let's get cracking! Part 3, Chapter 7, Queen Gome! Get closer to the fire, let the final death begin! The Jones came in fast, ready to shoot it out. They found a terrible crash site on the Galleon Plain, a badly wounded Kay, next to the dead, mangled body of Leica, amid a field of strewn wreckage. They put a few rockets into Leica's giant body just to be certain she was dead, leaving her in flaming pieces. And then they took her head off for good measure. The Jones cautiously collected Kay's body, still encased in its hideous shadow tech suit. They attempted to get him out of his sinister suit, but found it quite impervious to their efforts. Wary of it, detecting massive levels of shadow tech toxicity, they attached him by his neck to a chain and dragged him along the scrubby ground behind their land vehicle. There was Gallia Palace, and all that waited within. It rose up straight and tall in gothic majesty against the flat Baz Plains, its conical battlements speckled with slits of dim orange lights from openings in the stone. Atop the high walls, spotlights pan down in slow, whitish arcs, lighting up the night, an island of glitz in the darkened plain. A drawbridge came down, and Kay was dragged into a darkened central courtyard. A gaggle of twenty people aimlessly milled about. They saw Kay being dragged in and came at a crazed, ghoul-like run. Lord Blanchford! Lord Blanchford! They cried as they neared, drawing knives from their clothing. It was his house staff, fully under the control of the Jones. There was Andorra, his mother's personal assistant, always stately and proper in accordance with her important position in the household. Oiled, brown hair teased like a harlot, barely dressed, everything falling out, fingering a poison knife. They fell on Kay, pulling on his tanks, prodding with their knives, probing for weak points in the shadow tech, all the while asking if they could make him breakfast and turn his linens. They were like ants, trying to pry apart a doomed crab. Pick him up, please came a soft voice. Kay was hauled up by his arms. Standing there casually was Tal Daroga, in his cloak and white shirt, his trim blonde hair neat and tidy. He studied Kay's rather hard-looking shadow tech suit. Well, this is an interesting 
turn of events. Shadow Tech, it's pretty hideous as well. You're full of surprises. That is you in there, right, Kay? He glanced at the staff. Come on, girls, let's take him where he needs to go. The gibbering, half-naked staff hauled him off by his arms. They turned and moved north through the courtyard. The staff, their bare skin in direct contact with Kay's toxic Shadow Tech suit, were quickly sickened by it. They coughed and sweated. Their skin erupted in blazing red rashes that broke open and oozed. Soon they were spitting, gasping for air. Nevertheless, fully mesmerized, they enthusiastically followed Daroga's commands. Dragging Kay along with glee, Taldaroga spoke in a cheerful manner as they neared the palace entrance. Once again, I'm sorry about all this, Kay. I really am. You killed a great many of my brothers and sisters this evening. But it's not like we didn't have it coming to us. Let's make a pact. If you behave from here on out and do the right thing, then I'll do what I can to ensure your knee countess is restored. You have my word. They reached an iron door, sweating in the night air. Taudaroga opened it. The staff dragged Kay through. The interior of the palace was opulent. Fine rugs, rich paneling, and luxurious appointments from top to bottom. We're taking you to see our leader. She's not here on Baz, if that's what you're thinking. We've always understood the Vith are arcane and full of tricks. There's something to be said for the old acquisition magic the Vith used to employ. You know... The more cool stuff you have, the more powerful you become. Our leader is living proof of that, and so are you. We knew we couldn't beat you out in Blanchford. Your holdings and all the arcane things your house hoards gives you power. Just when it looked like you're done, a demon shows up and saves you. The Vith always have a trick or two up their sleeves. This palace was an old outpost of the Saranders before they got kicked off the planet. We've stockpiled arcane items here at our our leader's command and transformed it into something the old timers used to call a Gellertron. It's sort of an amplifier that allows our leader to travel great distances, to control things like animals, the people, even the weather. You saw of it this evening. Amazing what you Vith used to be able to do until you allowed the sisters to water your houses down. They twisted and turned through the complicated interior of the palace, many of the staff becoming sick with Shadow Tech poisoning. They got so sick they began retching. Yes, you need to clean that up, Taudaroga said, pointing. One of the staff, her body covered with rashes, stopped to clean up the mess. She was so weak she dropped her knife and fell face first into the pool of sick. She did not move after that. They continued on, Taudaroga making certain to remain several feet away from Kay at all times. Once our leader gives us Bella Thouser, we can truly serve mankind. We can put all this darkness behind us and celebrate a new day good will come from what was done tonight i truly believe that at the end of a dark paneled hallway they came to a closed doorway here it is a wonder from the age of the vith the gellertron the great beast that knocked you out of the sky passed through this very door it can become small or walk on two legs and be just as human as we are a true wonder Taudaroga unlatched the door and swung it open. Yellowish bright light came through, as if from a fully lit summer's day. He stepped through, followed by the staff, who dragged Kay with them. They emerged into a dusty, rather hot landscape, dotted with lazy hills, baked hard in the sun under a thin sky. Come along, Taudaroga ordered. As the staff pulled Kay down a gentle mountain path, they had lost some of their giddy verve along the way. They labored with him, grunting, crying as they were poisoned by Kay's suit. And then they succumbed, falling out, trembling on the dusty ground, leaving a little trail of colorful clothing and akimbo limbs of the fallen, marking their passage. As the staff fell out, others joyously came in to replace them. Overhead was a tepid sky painted with hazy clouds. A an ominous storm brewed in the distance. The shadow of a thin planetary ring climbed skyward like a pair of open scissors. Know where you are, Kay? 
Daruga asked. This planet has many names. It's an old Skyon of the Vith, a place of refuge safe from the growing power of the sisters. They knew what was coming, of the hand that was going to descend upon them, and here they staked their claim and put the dead in the sky above to defend it. Kay glanced up to the indistinct ring high overhead. This is a Dama Thrombo, the fastness of the Vith, as they were in their splendid pagan glory ages ago, a place no sister or anyone else has ever set foot the dead have seen to that the zaffins call it mare i believe deroga took a deep breath and looked around the old vith hid their sacred objects here to protect them from the sisters they're still where the vith left them several hundred miles to the west most are deactivated covered in dust i'd imagine your family has something stashed here somewhere all the old vith houses do sometimes i wish i was a vith and not a crap Bazer with a mongrel history. Such a pity. Waiting for them at the end of the trail was a Vist-style keep, surrounded on three sides by an ancient wall and adjacent ridge. Tall, temperate shrubs reached up pole-like into the arid air. Two spires guarded the western end of the enclosure. There seemed to be no central structure or edifice present on the surface, though a tunnel entrance built into the northern wall indicated structures hidden beneath the surface. Ochre sandstone of the finest quality lined the walls. A gallery of flawless white marble statues in both human and monstrous form, some ten feet tall, lined the center pass. Jones' battle units waited in the wings, covering Kay with their man-to-man -man rockets, polka-dotting him in targeting lasers. Armed snipers sat on their shoulders and hung from the towers like rotten fruit, covering him with their rifles. Heaped up near the tunnel entrance was a veritable mountain of piled treasure in the form of coins, paintings, weapons, and other valuables. It was unmistakable, all the swag taken from Castle Blanchford. In front of the pile was an odd sight, a large oak tree sitting askew, complete with wilting leaves and a mangled root ball. It was the machine, hidden behind its silver tech disguise, ripped from the ground in the Telmas Grove and stolen along with the rest. The remaining staff dropped Kay in the dust and backed away, all of them spitting and vomiting all over the rich clothes the Jones had dressed them in. Turning green, sick with shadow tech, Kay landed face down, his shadow of tech tanks clanking. A host of scanning cones instantly locked onto him. The ground ahead down the center pass was littered with a leafy carpet of fresh Horvath creepers, their livid white petals wilting in the sun, and their spores lacing the air in a perfumey haze. Into the line, Lord Blanchford, Taldorogus said in a cheerful fashion. If you wish to revenge yourself upon me as a ghost, I really wouldn't blame you. A storm cloud came in from the west and settled over the courtyard. From the open southern end, a mechanical procession appeared, bearing a massive litter of gold and carbuncle. Twelve Jones battle units painted black and adorned with decorative metal horns marched in. The elite forces had arrived. In the center of the litter they carried was a throne of bronze, molten-like and shiny, mixed with resplendent titanium. A luxurious robed figure of pale visage sat on the throne carrying a large black scepter. The Jones bowed in reverence as the litter passed them. Tauderoga roughly kicked Kay to the ground. Bow! bow before our mistress, she who will lead us to Bella Thouser. The procession reached the center of the courtyard, followed closely by the storm clouds, darkening the sky. Lightning struck, thunder cried out her name. Gom! The battle units lowered the litter to the ground and took their respective places at its side. The pale figure seated on the throne lightly stepped off coming forward, crushing the white creeper flowers underfoot, kicking up a glittery cloud of even more golden pollen. Kay caught glimpses of pale feet appearing through the hem of the robe and the swishing of pampered legs. As the figure passed the gallery of monstrous statues placed in the center of the clearing, they came to writhing, snarling life, complete with scaly texture and vivid, oily colors from a demented nightmare. The figure petted them with a clawed, passing hand as if they were mere pets. When the figure departed, 
and created some distance, the creatures returned to white, smooth statues locked into place. The figure selected two of her favorites, two snake-like worms, lurid with reds and blues and long, flicking tongues. The newly animated beasts padded along at her side. Beyond the perimeter of the enclosure, rain came down in sheets, creating a ghostly black curtain hanging from the sky and a chorus of solemn thunderclaps. Along the perimeter of the storm clouds, Joan's winger ships orbited the sky in lazy turns. The figure neared Kay and stopped. Pick him up. A stern, mirthless voice said. The worms thundered up, taking Kay into their stinking, tooth-lined maws, tugging on him like two dogs fighting over a piece of meat, almost, but not quite, tearing him apart. Their teeth and claws bit into the shadow tech. The figure stood before Kay, wearing a coarse white robe with a sash wrapped around her face. The figure removed the sash and let fall the robe. There, standing before Kay in jeweled veils, was the enemy, an ageless woman of a thousand names and faces, Lady Chrysania of Bloodstein, Queen Gome, and a host of others long forgotten. Here she was at long last, the immortal, the last of the old Bloodsteins, the evil waking self of Roth above George. She was a terrible sight. She wore Sam's face, her hair, her hands, her feet, her breasts, everything. Kay recognized them easily, though her expression and bearing were completely alien and uncaring, unlike the inviting, hugging, full of life Sam. This woman was quite a bit taller than Sam, shorter waisted and thicker in the hips, built like a typical bloodstein. She had a belly button which Sam did not have, and her skin complexion was that of a vith, pale but much more heavily pigmented than the bone white Sam. Her pigmentation had somehow leached into Sam's parts, darkening them a few shades. Her eyes were not Sam's. They were bright blue, vith blue, Sarah's eyes. Kay knew ahead of time that Queen Gome was wearing Sarah's eyes, as Sam's were in the cryo chest on Hoban. But seeing it in person was heartbreaking. Her hands bore ten claw-like fingernails sharp enough to slice metal, typical monoma claws. She had allowed them to grow out much longer than Sam did, even in her monoma heyday. Aimlessly, she clinked her claws together. So, Lord Blanchfort, she said in a sneering voice, raising her arms. We meet again. What think you? Am I not beautiful? Kay noted her scepter was studded with stout spikes. Kay did not reply. She swung her scepter down in a whistling arc, bearing it into Kay's helmet. Skewered, she hauled him up. Well? She demanded. Kay said nothing. Queen Gum spat in disgust. <sighs> what has happened to the Vith? Look what the ages have done. They've made you soft, made you pathetic. She looked at her pale monoma hands, studded with claws. Look at the filth with which you pollute your bloodlines. No Vith of old would admit a monoma to his bed, not even for a knight's pleasure. They are not Vith, they are not human. What of your household? What young will come of that? The true Vith are dead, and here is the proof. She raised her stolen hand, making a come-here motion with her fingers. Through the open end of the enclosure, a long black sledge-like vehicle twelve feet high and fifty feet long came in floating on a hover cone, kicking up the creeper spores, holding them in a grid-like pattern of force. Riding on the vehicle were a dozen, possibly more, lithe females, all beautiful, all oiled and nude, covered with colorful festive dots and swirls of paint. The sledge came to a halt in the center of the enclosure. The females bounded down in a well-practiced ballet and presented themselves to Queen Gome, bowing before her with nimble grace. She touched all of them gently on the top of the head and said their names. Alifair. Consenta, Vim, Melazar, Tentha, 
and on and on until she had greeted them all. Panels opened along the sides of the black vehicle, sliding back with a sinister hermetic hiss. Cold fog rolled out, revealing the sledge to be a giant trunk of sorts, containing innumerable shelves, drawers, pots, vases, jugs, and tankards full of vast quantities of water. In the center of the vehicle, Dozens upon dozens of bodies hung on hooks, swaying slightly, nudging against each other. The females, attendants of Gome, brought out jugs and vases and small golden chests, awaiting their master's command. Gome scowled at Kay. What did you think? That I simply had to have your pretty monoma wife's face? Is that what you thought? I couldn't care less about your bloody countess's face or any of her filthy monoma parts for that matter. I've been wearing pretty faces for centuries. Your wife does not rate in the top 10,000. See? Watch. She raised her claws and sliced Sam's face to ribbons. Blood poured out, staining her garments. With her thumbs, she poked Sarah's eyes out and cut off Sam's ears, throwing the ruined bits at Kay. Overhead, the rain stopped and the clouds parted. Swatches of sunlight passed through. Hmm, I suppose she's not so pretty any longer, is she? Queen Gome gibbered in a ghoul-like fashion, blood foaming from her wound, staining her linen garments. The attendants came forward. They brought forth a wooden bowl overflowing with glittering golden dust and a jug from which they poured clear water. The water, that dust. They took the water from the jug and washed Queen Gome. The blood from her destroyed face bubbled out, mixing with the water and dripping to the ground. They painted on a coating of dust. In one smooth motion, the attendants pulled what was left of Sam's face and Sarah's eyes from her head. As if peeling an orange, she stood there, her head hairless and blank. Two attendants came forward, holding a set of golden chests. They opened the chests. In one was a pair of lurid red eyes, like the eyes of a demon. In the other was a mouse sporting a long tongue and a sharpened set of teeth like that of a shark. Like children decorating a snowman, the attendants applied the eyes and mouth to Queen Gome's blank face, splashing water and dabbing golden dust. The red eyes blinked, taking on an evil depth, and she took in a long, deep breath through the mouth, allowing her tongue to pass over her sharp teeth. In a long procession, the remaining attendants brought forth bodies from the trunk, presenting them to Queen Gome, allowing her to pick and choose what she wanted. They washed Queen Gome again, powdered her with more dust, and on came a face stolen from some doomed maiden. It was so beautiful, it was hideous, so perfect it was formless. Her red eyes emerged through the eyelids like a set of angry moons appearing through breaks in the clouds. The selection process continued at a casual pace, Gome discarding Sam's parts and casting them into the dirt in exchange for select parts from the various bodies brought in for her inspection. The attendants also carried lengths of variously shaded hair as if dressing for a grand evening on the town. She selected a head of whitish gray hair, the lock slightly curled. The attendants pulled off her feet, adding perfect replacements from the trunk. In a moment, all of Sam, except for her clawed hands, which Gome kept, lay discarded in a heap on the ground like a pile of soiled laundry. Queen Gome stood tall, dripping wet, rebuilt as a smoky demoness with red eyes and pointed teeth. With brushes and pots of paint, the attendants decorated her in swirling dots and streaks of color. A final touch came out of the trunk. A pair of long, mottled horns, which the attendants placed on the sides of her head with dotted hands. They draped her hair around in loose swirls. Now the picture was complete. Now I can relax, she said, her voice now completely different. Pardon my horns, I do love them so. She pointed at the machine. And now... Taldoroga came up. He spoke to Kay in a calm, reasonable voice. The arcane defenses around the machine are quite formidable. We weren't expecting such a thing. Several of your staff died attempting to breach it for us. Can you take care of these defenses, please? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why should I? And I fully understand. If you do this for us, all these girls in your service who still live will be set free and sent home. 
I promise. We shall also attend to those requiring treatment for shadow tech poisoning. They can all walk away from this, and I know you care for them. Went to your grave protecting them. You can still be a hero, Kay. Just let her have the machine. Who's to care what she does with it? You and I and nobody else shall ever know the difference. Then we shall locate Bella Thouser, and all the suffering of man shall be forgotten. You can be the father of all of that. Kay slowly stood, the staff hovering around him, fingering their knives. They came up and moved him toward the machine, gripping him by the shoulders, their knives clutched in their hands. Andorra prodded his neck with her knife, looking for a weak spot. As Kay neared, the silver tech disguise around the machine moved aside in response to his presence. There it was, the machine, revealed at last. The great arch like two silver trees welded together. So this is it? Your cousin and the Wonderluck woman were right, Taldaroga said, standing next to Kay like an old friend. Such a seemingly innocuous thing for all this fuss, wouldn't you say? Scanning cones from the Jones focused on it, greedily bouncing off its contours in a dance hall display of light. They tabulated data. Are they removed, Kay? Are the defenses gone? Kay said nothing. We're gonna find out right now. Daroga motioned to the staff and they noisily surged to the machine. They passed through the perimeter of the silver tech disguise. They touched it with their hands, sauntered through the arch unharmed. Tal Daroga watched them carefully and tentatively touched it himself. Satisfied that the defenses around the machine were disabled, several Jones battle units approached. They lifted the machine and pulled it out of the hollow interior of the tree, setting it down to stand on its own. It gleamed untarnished and gold-like in the yellowy sunlight. They scanned it with handheld equipment. Inert, they said. Queen Gom walked across the courtyard, flanked by her beasts, given life by her presence. She stood under the machine's arch, her breast rising and falling in excitement. She reached up and passed her fingers across the round depression where the powering stone went. And where is the powering stone? She asked. Kay said nothing. She thundered up to Kay and lifted him up off the ground. Where is it? Not here, he replied in a strained voice. It's gone. I don't know where it is. What? She screeched, dropping him. One of the animated beasts at her side came at Kay, ramming its clawed foot to his chest, pinning him to the ground. Combs snapped her fingers. Several of her attendants went to the great trunk in the center of the enclosure, opening more panels. They lugged out a large wooden chest inlaid with brass. Do you really think hiding the stone shall prevent me its use? Do you? She asked, her lip curling, sharpened teeth gleaming. The beast flexed its reptilian foot, its claws digging into Shadow Tech. Kay struggled, unable to move. Oh, the vith through the ages, still the same. Why do you think I left the miserable league in the first place? Gom spat. The Jones in attendance mumbled in agreement. Her attendants clapped. Silence! She thundered. The attendants came over the carpet of creeper plants and set the chest down. Queen Gom patted across the creepers, the dark green leaves and white flowers crushing underfoot. The great beast looming over Kay reverted to marble as she moved away, its stone claws lodged in his chest. Gom pushed the attendants aside and opened the chest that had been brought out. Inside was a shining collection of large round jewels of immense carrot size. They glistened in deep greens, swirling reds, amber yellows, and glint Glinting blues like a trove of flawless, sparkling candy. Gome selected a purple stone from the chest and thundered toward Kay, holding it aloft. As she neared, the creature holding Kay to the ground reverted back to life, but more slowly this time. Its vivid colors mottled with stone slowly receding. The rain had stopped. The clouds overhead were nearly gone. Queen Gome took no notice. Look! Take a look. Did you think hiding the powering stone would stop me? I have dozens of them. I was there when this machine was constructed. I soothed Lord Want. I slept in his bed. He even asked me what color it should be. I favored purple back then. Taldaroga took the stone from her and inserted it into the machine's arch. It clicked into place. Ah, see? Now it's ready. Gom said. She glanced at Kay. The places one can go with this machine. I've wondered if I'd ever see it again. 
I was there, wrapped around Lord Want as his submissive pet. I can be rather fetching when I wish, when I want something, and I wanted this machine. How I've lusted after it, after centuries. I shall put it to proper use, and in a proper place. Gom flushed up in anger. One might think after centuries that patience would be one of my assets. Live for centuries, and the first thing to leave your soul is patience. You think I'm evil? You think I'm cruel? There's no good or evil in immortality. There's no right or wrong as you wait for days to fade into centuries. The only thing keeping one sane in the sea of time is waiting for things and allowing nothing to get in your way. And I want the machine. I want it. It belongs to me. It hasn't left my thoughts in centuries. There are things I would undo. There are things I haven't forgotten. And the passing of centuries does not make that any less. I heard all about the machine's resurrection after centuries. Well, Helicorm and Grand wouldn't stop talking about it in those silly posts she writes. She's a fool, of course, yet she seemed to be on to something. It was possible that the machine had been restored to wholeness at last. I heard nothing in Zaffin's space. Surely some warlord or Zaffin prince would have come forward and said something had they possessed it. I sat in my bower chest, gazing at the earthen spot I'd long prepared for it, and guessed that if the machine truly were out there, it would be somewhere in league space. So, I decided to go hunting for it in a passive fashion. There are several people inhabiting my body with me. There's the sniveling little girl who needed me to get her out of the sister's capture. And there's that soft voice from my dreams... I've known about her for centuries, the one who wouldn't stay quiet, the one who won't do what I tell her to do. My conscience, I've been told. What an inconvenience to have a conscience. And it seems she has her minions listening for her worrisome voice in the dark. I have learned to sleep in a protected place in my bower chest to keep her from communicating with her followers. Such a simple matter to deal with my conscience. However, the woman in my head has her uses. It occurred to me that I could use her hand-wringing antics to help me discover the machine. I've used her before. I've heard she is a genius, but she doesn't seem all that intelligent to me. All I need to do is sleep outside my bower chest and she comes to life, worshipped by her followers on Hoban. After that, it is a simple matter for my Jones friends to spy on them over the networks, listening for a minute to chatter and other tidbits that filter through. I heard tale of the Wonderlux from Rimnath as they claimed to process a number of old items from across antiquity, including the machine. They showed something that they claimed to be the machine to my attendants, but I had my doubts. So I decided to test them. I let the poor, fragile lady Crescenia out. The Wonderluck stared her, seeing not me, but that weak little girl in my head, figuring her for an easy mark and playing right into my hands. Using Crescenia, I set the Wonderlux to collecting Wilhella Corman Grand's Perlamum set she loves to tantalize heroes with. I assumed that the Wonderlux actually possessed the machine. They would have used it to collect the pieces. Unfortunately, they turned out to be frauds. Frauds with an ugly piece of homemade artwork they claimed was the machine. My blood was up. I was so close. I had to have it. I sent out notes to many houses, fishing for clues, for information. Most of my notes went unanswered. And then there you were, visiting old Castle Bloodstein, wishing to help poor Lady Crescenia, listening to her babble about lost love. The House of Blanchfort, so bold and adventurous. I should have known those of my line would have my machine. 
Kane. Gom glared at Kane. Yes, my blood flows through your veins. Castle Blanchford was once my home. I, in a sense, created you, and therefore I cannot stand you. I sent my Jones to you to dredge up information. Your cousin, the little blue-haired girl, said much. And there it was, out in Telmus Grove, in the oak trees that I helped plant ages prior. But of course, it was protected by powerful magic. Magic even I couldn't get through. That bloody silver disguise. So I needed you, here, in my place of power, to be rid of it. And here you are, at my feet. Gome sneered. Or, should I say, your wife's feet. Tauderoga came up beside her in subservient fashions. And what shall we do with Lord Blanchford? She sneered again and thought a moment. What shall we do with my great-great-great-grandson? His task is done. The machine is free. First, let us get him out of his suit. She pointed with Sam's claws to an attendant. Get me some dust! An attendant bowed and presented the bowl of golden dust to her. She held up the bowl. Queen Gome plunged her clawed hand in deep, withdrawing a handful of glittering dust that trickled through her fingers in golden streams. She thundered up to Kay, smearing the dust roughly into his black bubble helmet. It instantly reacted to the shadow tech, steaming, hissing, eating through it. I've just wasted a whole handful of dust on you. Enough for a hundred years' use. Why? Because I never run out. I have enough dust for a thousand immortalities. The golden dust and the shadow tech roiled about, bubbling and dripping off in boiling blobs. Kay's helmet was quickly eaten through, revealing his face. The grotesque parts stuffed down his throat melted and he coughed up black slime. His hideous black suit dropped off in slug-like patches. Gome scoffed, seeing Kay on his knees. Look at the state of my progeny. She thought a moment, considering what his fate would be. Ah. I know. I shall give you a death the old Vith, the real Vith, would have been proud of. As you are my kin, it's the least I can do. She pointed off to the east. Behold! See what your ancestors wrought in defiance of the sisters. See what you have squandered. From the lonely passes of the hills to the east, something cried out. Its shrill roar, echoing in the solitude, rolling over the land. A black-winged form crested the hills and struck a pose there like a gargoyle, a silhouette in broad daylight. A demonic face, pinpricked by two orange eyes, turned to the courtyard. Kay was locked in its crawling gaze. It gave off a drifting pall of smoke, framing itself in a veil of hell. Then it took flight winging its slow way down with heavy wing beats to the flats, snorting a trail of superheated gases from its nostrils. As it neared, it came into clear focus. It was some sort of dragon-like creature made of hammered brass and fitted steel, all enameled to a dark midnight blue. Its head and neck were 50 feet long, its articulated pear-shaped body about 200, and its long segmented tail about a thousand. It seemed to be wearing some sort of armored breastplate bearing the bloodstained crest forged in resplendent notchless brass against dark blue. It had two round windows or portholes cut into the breastplate at either shoulder. Fierce orange light came out of the windows as if a great fire burned within. It had a muscular bird-like set of brass legs tipped with ring claws which it kept tucked into its chest as it flew. It appeared to have no front legs. Exhaust ports lined the complex hammered ridges of its back exuding great belches of super hot steam and coal black smoke and regular cloudy pulsations, leaving a trail of churning clouds as it passed. Kai, while gamed up, had dreamt of this monstrosity. Here was the bower chest of Queen Gome, a carryover from her bloodstained roots. This was the creature that had destroyed Kay's Shadow Tech ship with its arcane claws and its scalding steam. The beast of old from the days of the splendor of the Vith was before him at last. It made a slow, somewhat predatory circle of the keep, snorting steam, churning the air with steam and burning fumes. 
It extended its claws and came to an earth-shaking perch on the northern wall, accompanied by a blast of steam and smoke. It fanned its wings and gave those in the courtyards a great wing flap, kicking up a cyclone of gravel and creepers. Queen Gom raised her arms in welcome, and the beast acknowledged her, lowering its head to the ground. She came up and lovingly caressed its metal skin. This is what my family, the Old Bloodsteins, hid here on Idamathrombo. These walls are its home. I have fed it. This is an old Vith bower chest, mystical constructs of an age now forgotten in the sisters' drunken moribund league. All the old households had one roaming the castle grounds in all shapes and colors, darkening the skies, making the ground tremble in their majesty. Inside the bower chest, we kept our most sacred and powerful objects, and they, in turn, give it life. Inside my bower chest, under constant vigilance, is where I keep the things of great importance I have collected over the centuries. Here is where the machine shall go, and I, from the safety within, shall have dominion over the universe itself. Queen Gome pointed at the fallen K. Everyone backed away. Kill him! She said to the bower chest. I give you the honor. Without hesitation or delay, the great metal creature curled its neck, breathed in, and shot forward, on exhaling a withering blast of steam. Kay wilted under the attack, and the last few bits of his Shadow Tech suit were blasted off. He was scalded beet red and then consumed totally, flesh and bone melting away, leaving little more than a discolored patch on the ground, gone in an instant. The Jones cheered. The hypnotized staff giggled. The attendants, apparently used to this sort of spectacle, remained quiet, ready to carry out Queen Gome's next command. Gome curled her lip and glanced at the Blanchford staff capering about, all teetering, sick with shadow tech. These people are all his sniveling servants. Is that right? Yes, my queen, Talgaroga said. Collect them in the center. He hesitated. I promised Lord Blanchford I would send them home. I will send them home. I will certainly do that. Collect them in the center, along with the Monoma's disgusting parts. Taldoroga herded the staff girls into the center of the courtyard. Where's Lord Blanchford? they asked as they fingered their poison knives. We miss him, Andorra said, so badly poisoned her teeth were coming out by their roots and horrid strings. You'll see him in a moment, Taldoroga said, backing away. I'm sorry, where are Lady Samadoran's parts? Two attendants looked about. We do not see them. Queen Gome turned to the great metal beast. Enough! We shall find the parts later. Kill them! The metal beast lifted its head and took in a great expansion of air in a rushing vortex, ready to exhale a second deadly steam blast and scald the staff into oblivion. Just as it was ready to let fly, it seemed to hesitate and diminished in size. It tucked in and curled up, folding its wings, placing its head on the ground. Valves snapped open and clouds of pure white steam vented from its pipes, climbing into the sky like churning geysers. The light from its furnace grew dim and cold, and then went out entirely. Sooty smoke belched from its sides. It seemed to be asleep. Gome watched with sputtering fury. Stop! What happened? She screeched. Her attendants looked on in confusion. It has been shut down, my queen, one of them stammered. How? How is that possible? My queen, we don't know. Chaos came down on the enclosure. Powerful explosions ripped through the Jones ranks, felling one Jones battle unit after the next. For the first time, Queen Gome and Taldoroga appeared confused and unsure of themselves. Queen Gome! came a voice laden with fury. Your conscience is about to have her day. Her voice is about to be heard. She is eager to make right what you have done. Your time has come at last. Queen Gome looked around. Who is speaking? Who is speaking? The voice answered in a calm manner. The man you've stolen from. The man whose beloved wife you have mutilated. Gome threw back her head and laughed. Ha 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 Ah, grandson, hiding behind a cloak. 
still have a little bit of vith cunning in you after all. I must admit to a bit of pride in my kin having the audacity to attempt to stand against me. Perhaps there's a bit of my blood in you after all. That was a shadow tech similacrum you ordered killed. A spineless fake for you to have your fun with. I had a final use in the bag and it served me well, did it not? I will strike you down with rain and lightning! I see no clouds. Gome looked skyward, seeing a clear sky. Confusion crossed her face. The remaining Jones battle units adjusted their lines and saturated the courtyard with scanning cones and a dusting of no cloak powder, trying to locate Kay's cloaked form. You spoke of the Vith, came Kay's voice. See the Vith, and see the face of your doom. Kay appeared several feet away, wearing a hideous black suit, holding his glowing carg. Lord Blanchford! Lord Blanchford! The staff cried, approaching him at a run, lifting their knives. They ran into his carg. They were so weak from their shadow tech poisoning that they fell with only slight, non-cutting blows. Targeting cones saturated him from the Jones, ready to fire. Man-to-man rockets left out of their tubes and headed in fast. Kay vanished at the last second, the rockets exploding on nothing. Overhead, winger ships orbited, dropping no-cloak powder bombs and saturating the courtyard in high-energy scanning cones. You want the truth, Queen Gome? Came Kay's voice. Here is truth. A Jones winger ship was knocked out of the sky, followed by a second. A battle unit was hit and shredded, and then another. An H grenadier was blown off its feet, a mangled operator dying at the controls. K appeared before them again. He held up a pale monoma face with long black hair. Behold, as you destroyed with malice, I repaired with love, using your own water and dust right under your nose. For the love of my wife and my kin, I am ending this now. He placed Sam's face back into his pouch. With Gome's bower chest asleep and the storm clouds gone, her vast power seemed to be greatly diminished. Her faithful Jones servants seemed a little less in her thrall, some hesitating at their controls, some even abandoning their battle units and other equipment and fleeing into the desert. The marble beasts were sluggish and slow to come to life. One, partially transformed, exploded in a cloud of guts and crushed marble. A second beast reached Kay and was impaled on his carg. He lengthened the shaft, lifting the beast over his head. It fell out of Queen Gome's sphere of influence and reverted to a statue. Kay rammed it to the ground, shattering it. A third was lifted into the air by an invisible hand and thrown a considerable distance away. A giant, six-armed, high-tath form briefly appeared in a fading scanning cone and then disappeared. We are so close! Taldoroga roared and came in at a run, yelling, speaking hypnotic words, trying to bring Kay under his control. The Shadow Tech suit shut out his voice and blurred his image. This time there would be no hypnosis, no Jones tricks. This time, with room to move and full use of his carg, Kay met Taldoroga in battle. He first wounded his right arm, then his left. Kay ran him through, intentionally missing all the vitals, flicking the blood off his carg. He battered him. He knocked him about, inflicting a multitude of searing cuts, turning the man who caught bullets in Castle Blanchford into a nearly helpless, bleeding mass. Sniper fire came down from the walls, hoping to take Kay down. He casually sighted the bullets coming in and wafted away to avoid them, spinning Daroga around, bleeding in agony. Daroga fought on unarmed, trying but unable to pierce Kay's defenses. Tired of the game, Kay swept him down and ran him through the chest. So close, he gurgled. Kay then turned his attention to Queen Gome. She spat and raised her scepter to brain him with it. He countered with his card. You are not walking away from this, Kay said. Grinning, she engaged, whirling her scepter, their weapons clashing. One of the few remaining on-duty battle units came to cover Queen Gome. As it moved into position, it was split down the center like a tin can, the operator ripped from his seat by an invisible hand. Another battle unit exploded into flaming wreckage. A sniper went down, and then another, and then another. Most of the Jones were now either deceased or had fled. Victory was at hand. Kay met Queen Gome's scepter and turned his car, cutting through it down the center in a shower of sparks. Kay reached out to take her 
her at last. Queen Gome threw her useless weapon down and lunged at Kay, throwing her arms around him. Kay was rocked back by a tremendous explosion and thrown to the ground. As he lay there dazed, Gone kicked him twice with a gut-wrenching effect. Satisfied that Kay had been dealt with a mortal blow, she turned to her grand prize, the machine, gleaming in the sun, splashed with droplets of the Jones' blood. But as she approached, the great silver tree created by Lady Poe Blanchford that had hidden it in the Telmus Grove came to life. With flowing silver tendrils, it lifted the machine off the ground and retracted, returning it to the hollow of its trunk, where the silver flowed back around it. A moment later, an entire length of the tree became studded with savage thorns dripping with deadly night poisons, daring Queen Gome to come closer and be destroyed. Shing! came the sound of the thorns unsheathing. From knotholes along its length, a legion of tiny silver STTs paraded out, moving into position, defending the tree and its machine within like a colony of enraged ants, jaws opened, ready to kill. Deterred by the deadly display, she sprinted away, pushing through the crowd of staff and attendants. She ran to the tunnel at the far end of the enclosure and disappeared, her attendants following. Kay shakily got up on one knee, trying to regain his wits and assess what damage he had sustained. The Shadow Tech suit had held. The killing blow she inflicted upon him had been warded off. The giant form of Laika fell out of cloak and came to his side, helping him up. She was lusty with battle, her DD rifle still smoking, her swords dripping with crazy streams of hydraulic fluid and blood. Kay has heard stories that Hytath, when in the heat of battle, tended to grow in size, and Laika had grown from from her usual 10 feet to a whopping 16 feet tall, her composite armor strained to hold her in. Hail, Jarokan! she yelled lustily, her voice thundering. Shadow tech from Bag worked well. Leka kill many Jones. Well done. Come, Leka, we can't let her get away. Together, they tore off in pursuit. Every bit of Kay's body hurt. What in the name of creation did she hit me with? Abaleth! Leka cried. Explosive powder. Mother tells Leka, go and where's Abaleth? Kay's guts were ablaze with agony. Confirmed. Thanks for the heads up, he wheezed. They reached the end of the enclosure. There was a tunnel-like archway cut to the stone leading underground. Ten new attendants, oiled and dotted, stood before it, hefting spears at the ready position, blocking the entrance. None of them looked like they were in a particular mindset to fight. Leka rose up to full height and covered the attendants with her DD, three lags, and two swords, still fresh with Joan's blood. She was itching to pull her triggers, battle less filling her. Several attendants dropped their spears and fell to the ground, praying for mercy. Step aside, please. This needn't concern you, Kay said, and the attendants promptly moved aside. Cover them, Leka. Gome! Kay roared as he entered the passage. He thundered forward, brandishing his car, ready to take his prize. Within was a dimly lit corridor heading down into the sublevels beneath the surface enclosure, marking the walls of the passage at regular intervals with a series of glass display cases, all lit up in warm orange light. Inside the cases were golden artifacts and precious stones arranged in a museum-like setup. One after the other, reminders of past theft, past conquests, Gome had so much she could afford to leave some out. Kai's words from the end of the hidden surprise filtered into his thoughts. She's got these cases all lined up. Just stuff she liked but didn't really think too much about. What you're looking for is in there. She didn't know what she had. Didn't know what she had. Was Kai referring to the artifacts of Vihelm? Kay had assumed the artifacts of Ehelm must have been among her most closely guarded treasures kept safe in the belly of her bower chest. But what if she didn't know or properly understand what those artifacts did? What if she thought they were simply beautiful trinkets and left them out in the open in a display of other pretty but otherwise unimportant pieces of treasure? If that was the case, then she had made a colossal blunder. What had Rawl said? She thought Vihelm of Wham had mawicked her into a protracted sleep. She didn't know he had used the necklace and the headset to bind her. Didn't know what she had. Eyes wide behind his shadow tech bubble, Kay examined every case down the line. Full of treasure, each splendid, each full of lost weapons and plundered armor, rare trinkets and jewelry for the gods, all perfect, just a fringe of her massive hoard. And there, somewhere down the line, was a case laid out with rare 
band of bits of gorgeous swag. A wondrous necklace of twisting golden finery was laid out on the upper shelf, and on the lower shelf a headset of red brass and flawless copper, striking colors, the workmanship and genius of design stood out and caught his eye. Here they were, the long artifacts of Vihelm of Wham, set out display of things that Quingome liked, thought pretty enough to display, but didn't think important enough to protect in her bower chest. The cult of Rothaba had kept their secret hidden all this time. He crashed into the case with his carg and removed the necklace and the headset, holding them in his hands, marveling at their construction. He opened his Shadow Tech bag and placed them inside atop all the parts of Sam he had so lovingly collected out of the dust and repaired under Queen Gome's nose. Victory for Sam was in his grasp. He continued down the corridor. A bit farther down, the corridor ended in a circular room featuring a pair of pools of shallow water and a great wooden door that Queen Gome was opening with a palm lock. Her attendants stood with raised spears defending her. A bowl of golden noberry dust and a jug of overturned water lay discarded nearby. Pools of water! Before Kay could stop himself, the creeper in his head spoke. Not in control of his own body, he plunged into one of the pools and sank to the bottom. Moments later, a torrent of spears penetrated the water, the attendants stabbing him again and again, plunging their weapons into him over a dozen times from top to bottom. Thinking him dead, they returned to Queen Gome's side. The Shadow Tech suit had protected him from the spears, turning them back, and it also furnished him with oxygen. As he lay there unharmed, undrowned, the creeper voice in his head that was compelling him to drown himself, thwarted and denied a victim, lessened over a few minutes until he had control of his wits. He sighted from the pool's bottom to assess the situation. Queen Gome had opened the door. A torrent of black fumes gushed out, filling the room with dense, choking smoke. Through the door was a chamber full of treasure items piled to impossible heights, all burning in a horrendous inferno of fire and smoke. The door seemed to be an escape route she had hoped to make use of, to pass through and be away. This door must be an arcane portal Sarah had called the Geller Door. How many times in the past had Queen Gome faced destruction, faced defeat, only to slip away through a door just like this one and left to vanish without a trace? Just like at the Battle of the Tomb on Tremble, cornered, defeated, and then gone to rise again somewhere else. However, this time her escape was not to be. This time the fires of hell itself awaited her on the other side of the door. The smoke quickly incapacitated Gome and her attendants. She crouched on one knee, hacking, struggling for breath. Kay rose from the pool, clambered out, and seized her by the horns. He roughly plunged her into the pool, washing off her deadly aboleth dots before she could devastate him with them again. She coughed and sputtered. Her voice rang out with a dirge. Die! Fall upon your own cog! She ordered. Kay felt the stinging touch of her dirge, but it was too weak to sway him. He dunked her again, making certain the aboleth was gone. She looked like a drenched horned rat. Do as I command! She screeched, spitting water, a hint of desperation in her voice. Kay drew the necklace from his bag. Gom saw the piece and struggled. What are you doing with that? That item belongs to me! Yes, it does. And I intend to give it to you. She made a final attempt to break loose and flee, but Kay held her down. She slapped at him with her hands, but the aboleth was gone. Her palms turned a blazing shade of red, the beginnings of Shadow Tech poisoning. She screamed with fury as Kay slipped the necklace over her head and around her neck, past the horns and draped gray hair. The effect was immediate. She gasped, fell silent, and went into a deep sleep, one from which she could not awaken until the necklace was removed. With Goem out of the way, he could deal with the attendants. They were in no shape to fight or mount a defense. The smoke from the open door was overwhelming them. Kay shut the door, cutting off the smoke. One by one, he dragged them to the pool and dunked them, washing away the powder. Out, he barked as he finished the final one. Everybody out. Naked and dripping, they meekly followed his command, all of them hacking and struggling for breath as the smoke from the fire cleared. Kay followed, carrying Queen Gome. Outside in the bright sunlight, Leica terrorized the remaining attendants, had them cowering on the ground by the wall. The four attendants came out and sprawled to the dirt, thankful for a breath of clean air. Leica, fetch some water, Kay yelled. 
Leica marched away, soon returning carrying an impressively large tankard of water, the size of a bathtub, taken from the open trunk in the center of the enclosure. Dunk all of these attendants, please. We want to make certain all of that aboleth powder is gone. Leica was overjoyed. Get in the water, attendants. Do not anger Leica. Move! You first! Get in! The attendants meekly stepped into the tankard one at a time, and Leica thoroughly dunked them by the hair. Kay laid Quingome down on the ground. The necklace of Vihelm was doing its job. She was out cold, her breathing shallow but steady. He then pulled the headset of Vihelm from his pouch. It comprised a number of copper fingers and gentle pads meant to rest against the base of the skull behind the ear. He fitted it over her ear, situating it around her horns, which was no easy task and took some doing. The antennas came up like a pair of alien feelers glinting in the sunlight. It seemed to be properly installed. With the head set in place, Roth above George should awaken at long last. Attendants wash, Jarokon, Leica proudly announced. They huddled on the ground, hair stringy, all of them wet and miserable. Kay and Leica stood over the silent, demonic form of Queen Gome, waiting for a new woman to stir. And with that... We conclude part three, chapter seven, Queen Gome. Ugh, I am spent. That was an exciting chapter. Lots of things happened. Gome presented herself as suitably arrogant and in command. Things quickly slipped away though as her Geller powers faded. And remember, Philip and Thomasina's efforts in burning her hordes had an effect, had lessened her her Geller powers, her ability to control the weather and control people's minds and bring life to the lifeless was greatly diminished. And Kay and Leica cloaked, took her on as the fake Kay that he had created with the Shadow Tech bag, took all the punches and then Kay and Leica attacked when they were ready to do so. And then uh, Queen Gome pulled a surprise just as she was ready to be defeated she abolefed him right to the gut fortunately his shadow tech suit saved him from being blown open went down into the ground and tried to escape through one of her gellertron doors opened into an inferno of a burning horde at set by philip and thomasina previously Kay puts the stuff on her at long last and she falls into unconsciousness and we await her awakening as a new person but don't think this kerbuffle with queen gome is over just yet because it's not no good villain is just gonna go down like that no we have more to go we have more ordeal to pass through next week Chapter 8, The Dead Fall from the Sky. I wonder what that means. What new players are going to present themselves on the battlefield. Once again, I thank my cover artist and good friend Carol Phillips for reading Queen Gome's lines. Great job, Carol. I'll leave a link to her channel on YouTube where she sings and does speed paints and so forth. She's a, a person of many talents. So next week, we will continue Part 3, Chapter 8, The Dead Fall from the Sky. This is Ren Presents... I am your host, Ren. Peace out.